Ladies and gentlemen, um, we are going to uh, uh, cover now uh, an important, um, uh, important enabler for developing confidence and an understanding of model results, developing confidence in a model, understanding model behavior, and in many cases, getting a modeling paper published. And that enabler is sensitivity analysis. Uh, performing systematic explorations of the behavior of a model, changing assumptions of that model, commonly conducted for changing parameter assumptions regarding that model, sometimes in so-called structural sensitivity analysis, changing the structure of the model, for example, adding a new state or disabling a certain transition. Um, Wade conducted a sensitivity analysis involving chickenpox where he disabled boosting of immunity um, uh, upon re-exposure in as much as it affects shingles emergence, etc. Sensitivity analysis is a topic that is well supported, is a, is a, a process that's well supported by any logic. And we have two ways we can explore it. Um, one way is uh, by actually taking, it'll probably take about 20 minutes or so, we could actually turn the model we've been building into a model that features sensitivity analysis as well. So build in the requisite mechanisms to conduct sensitivity analysis with this model. It would probably take 15 to 20 minutes or so. Alternatively, we could use a model that's built into any logic to illustrate sensitivity analysis. It's a different model, a model you haven't seen thus far, but one which would communicate features of it. That would save us about 20 minutes. I'm gonna give a set of slides on sensitivity analysis from a conceptual standpoint, but having recourse to either our model augmented for it, or one of the built-in models to perform sensitive analysis will make it more concrete. So I want to get a, a, a census of, of, of opinions. I want to get a vote here. And by virtue, by, by good uh, comparison to Australia's success as a democracy, I will make voting compulsory. <laughs> uh, so how many people would like to see this existing model in about 15 or 20 minutes rendered into a form where it fully supports sensitivity analysis. The alternative is to just use a, a model which is already uh, set to support sensitivity analysis. It's a model. It's not. It, it, well, uh, it's, it's only uh, peripherally relevant, um, I'll show you. But the basic deal is, as with some other things with PLE or, or with non-professional, you, you can still do most things, not all, but most, but it requires a slight bit more of work, uh, a bit more of work. For example, the professional supports model-run comparisons directly, whereas you have to, you have to do a bit of work to, 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 to achieve that without it. Same thing with sensitivity analysis, there's kind of a a model sensitivity analysis experiment, as I recall, in the professional. But we can basically do what we need to with, um, uh, with something called the parameter variation experiment. So how many people would prefer to make the change to see it, how you support model sensitivity analysis in this model? Okay. Oh, what? Sorry. Sorry. Okay. Can we get a tally? Um, so could one of the TAs tally up? Seven? 
Seven? Okay. How many people would prefer to use the built-in model um, where it's already enabled? Oh, okay, okay, no, that's a clever, that's clever. Um, okay. Okay, so it sounds like, did the TAs count that? It sounds like the vote is for adding it in. Hello? What, who, what run the, ran the vote? What won the vote? First one, okay, okay. We're gonna go add it in. So, ladies and gentlemen, gird your loins. Um, and actually, it's not gonna be that bad. It's not gonna be that bad, okay? Um, okay, I'm starting model uh, contagion v12. I will upload this. And if people wanna just watch it, I will upload the fruits of this labor. So you can then use it, okay? Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, what we are going to do is to go here and add a new type of experiment to this. You do new experiment. It's going to be what's called a parameter variation experiment. You notice there's some ones that are that are seem relevant that are that are grayed out, Monte Carlo experiment, for example, or a sensitivity analysis, um, compare runs, a little bit relevant. Parameter variation, though, is the one supported in PLE, so we're gonna use that, okay? And this is kind of doing it from the base. Okay, this is gonna be called, um, come on, parameter, Parameter variation experiment. Parameter variation, okay? Um, and, um, and we can actually say where do we want it to, to draw base assumptions from, but we won't check that. Okay, so parameter variation experiment, okay? It says copy model time settings from a certain place. No, I'll just say parameter variation. Okay, we've added it. Here it is. Now, this experiment is going to be different from the experiments we've conducted thus far in a couple of regards. Most notably, it is going to need to run the model just, just once, but many times. Many times for different versions of parameters, but potentially many times for just to run it with a given set of assumptions, that is a given set of parameter values, many times to understand the effects of stochastics. So, you go to parameter variation, uh, experiment, this new experiment, you'll notice that we can set a number of things. One thing is we can set whether it's a uh, very different range or whether it's drawn from a set of values, say from random, from distributions. If, if so, we could set the number of runs. If it's varied in range, we're actually going to tell it to undertake a fixed number of different experiments. By default, those will involve arithmetic changes to parameter values. Say we'll make population size go from a minimum of, of 100, for example, to 200 with a step of 10. You know, we'll progressively do 100, 110, 120, 130, et cetera. Or we might wish to change the mean duration of infection, et cetera, within a range. Now, you might see this as constraining, but I'll return to this later, because actually, uh, blanking, Jason, blank. Okay, about, what, 10 seconds? 10 to 15, roughly, maybe? Again, okay? Okay. Again. Okay. Great. Okay, excellent. The experiment has now been multiply falsified. Okay. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, but we're going to leave this right now. In order to enable that stepping, we're going to need to do range. That's how we would vary them. But we're going to come back to this. I'm going to give a little bit of conceptual overview, and we're going to see something else. Okay. 
So sensitivity analysis has many different bases, many different types of sensitivity analysis. We can conduct sensitivity analysis along multiple axes, multiple considerations being varied. Most common ones are with respect to the parameters being varied, the assumptions being varied. Is it one way? You're varying one thing at a time, sort of univariate? Or is it multivariate? You're, you're varying several things at a time. You're varying this parameter and that parameter together. Um, are you conducting the sensitivity analysis with respect to a parameter value or with respect to model structure more deeply? Are you varying in a way that leads to defined alternative values or do you want to draw from a probability distribution? To what degree are you sampling from a distribution in a dense or a sparse way? We're going to see there are these constructs, Latin hypercube sampling and orthogonal array sampling, which guarantee a certain exploration of the space. That it, while, while we can't try all possible combinations of n parameters, maybe we can at least guarantee that each parameter has been sampled for each range of important range of value. Or for orthogonal array sampling, we can guarantee that for each pair of parameters, we've explored pairs of possible values, um, uh, ranges for each, uh, we've, we've taken pairs, um, and with one pair for each possible pairing of different possible values or ranges of values those parameters could take on. Okay. Those guarantee a certain, it's not fully exhaustive, but a certain thoroughness of exploration. We may also want to have parameters retaining a value or, or a simulation retaining a, a static exploration or a, a, a fixed trajectory over time or have stochastic processes. Okay, um, uh, where we have um, stochastics explored uh, within the within the model. Okay, um, or maybe where we have parameters vary stochastically over time. Okay, um, here I had argued that the models capture, in some cases, our articulation of kind of a theory of a, 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 a working hypothesis for how the system works. In other cases. You know, they're capturing a, a simple stylized theory, and we want to understand its, its implications, okay? Um, and structural sensitivity analyses allow us to see, okay, how do the results change as we change model structure? We vary the structure of the model, and we see the impact on results, okay? Now, one of the challenges of this, one of the big challenges of sensitivity analysis has to do with its relationship with what's called calibration. And I'm going to cover that later. I'm going to probably cover that, well, it's going to be tomorrow. Um, but the, the, there is a question, OK, do you conduct sensitivity analysis um, and perform calibration for different possible values, say, of a parameter? You recalibrate. Or do you? Do you calibrate first and then perform sensitivity analysis around that, which is our most common way of, of doing it? And similarly, with structural sensitivity analysis, if you modify model structure, it's very common to then calibrate each of those alternative model renditions, you know, model with this structure or that one or that one, which might reflect different theories for the underlying process. Remember, models can be theory building tools. You might have four different models which, which describe different competitive dynamic hypotheses. You calibrate each of them to the data to account as best you can for the empirical data with appropriate parameter values that are less well known um, as part of this, and then you compare the results. So structural sensitivity analysis, examining the effects of changing model structural assumptions is often associated, often accompanied by recalibration. What Wayne did the other day was a little bit like this, where he examined, okay, if um, you know, if we had no, 
a boosting going on, or we did have boosting going on, how would that change the results of the model? But I don't believe for each of those cases there was a recalibration that took place. It was just from the calibrated model, you then examine that with, cal with, with boosting on and with not. But sometimes you recalibrate the model entirely. To give it the most competitive, basically give it to say, OK, suppose we assumed instead for the model this dynamic hypothesis and we calibrated using that. How would it change our policy recommendations? How would it change our recommendation or our anticipation of what, what we expect to see in coming months or years, et cetera? How would it change our expectations of, of model outcomes? So this is an important question of how does calibration enter into this? And I'll see if I can refer to that when we have the calibration lecture, OK? Um, so in this case, model uncertainty, model uncertainty, uncertainty concerning model structure, you know, we're considering uncertainty about the underlying process. Um, it turns out there's some linkages here to machine learning. Um, and uh, particle filtering you'll see featured in some of the posters, and then you'll see it next week, uh, sorry, next week, tomorrow as well. But fundamentally, it's a way of um, trying to adjust model uh, state estimates as well for PMCMC, model parameter estimates um, uh, as new data comes in to sort of update our understanding. And we'll come back to that. OK. Um, so uh, what we're going to do is um, going to be uh, examining here um, particularly parameter um, uh, parameter sensitivity analysis and, and variation, okay? Um, and, you know, here we might, we might uh, vary certain parameters and see how much do certain parameters affect the outcome of the model, which change it the most, for example, um, where each axis might represent a percent change in a certain parameter, and you show how does that affect a given outcome of the model, for example. And I'd like to show you um, how these are conducted. So we're going to do this with our own model rather than with the built-in model. We've already added this parameter variation, but we need to undertake some, some further work. But before we do this, I would like to just try running this. I'd like you to set for parameters varied in range. And I'd like you to set it to have 10 runs. Okay? And I'm doing this for a reason. Notice we're not changing any parameter values here. What are these things here? These are what? Begins with P. These are parameters from the model. Notice that this is a parameter variation experiment which is taking place using the main class, the, uh, the main class to represent main. So, oops. Top level agent is main. Make sure it's main. Remember the main. Here we are. These are the values in main. And if we were to run this, let's try that. Run. And you'll notice it comes up with this thing here. Okay? Who needs TA help? TAs? Are TAs needed? So what did I do? I went to the parameter variation experiment, I made sure it said main, and then I ran it. I right clicked and ran. Boom, boom, boom. Here comes the window. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like you to press this button. And you'll notice it says it finished. You'll notice it, it has some reports here from running the model. It looks very different. Oh, are you writing 832? Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have recourse to 8.1, I would, I would suggest you download my model and do it in 8.1 just because it's going to be a little bit easier to compare with what's on my screen. Okay. And it turns out that 8.1 makes better use of multiple cores, it seems, as well. Okay, so if, yeah, yes, 
Well, OK. OK, so I'm sorry? No, no, this is grayed out. It's grayed. Yeah. yeah, it's grayed. So, so if you're using 8.3.2, uh, I apologize. But if you could, if you could download from the site it, model, Contagion v, v11 and open it, that will allow you to do this in 8.1. It will just be directly comparable to what I'm doing here. I apologize for the trouble. But it'll put us on the same page. And it turns out, for some of what we'll be illustrating, that will be more useful, 8.1. 8.3.2, I don't know, but I've been told that, um, um, that, uh, that um, 8.3.2 sensitivity analysis um, is not fully gold. Um, so it's, it's not very, uh, for multiple processors, it's uh, for calibration and maybe sensitivity, it's not going to use it to all its, its best regard. So if you could download mine and, and do it in, in 8.3.1, that would be best. So I will show this on the screen in the meantime. I ran it, I, I opened it up, ran it here, and I pressed this button to run it. And you notice it ran one run. Here, I pushed the button in the upper left, this one here, the green button. I pushed it, and it ran the run and finished. You notice it ran this run, as we say, headless. Well, you don't say quite headless. It doesn't show the user interface for the model. And in fact, it runs it faster, because it doesn't have to show the, the visualization. This is a notable performance gain. Without having to show the visualization, it can save considerable time. So just by adding a parameter variation experiment and leaving it in this varied in range, you can actually make your model run faster without the, without the UI, but just saying run and pressing this button. It will run it once and finish it. Now, why did it only run it once? Because we told it just use these fixed values. Instead, maybe I want to say freeform here, OK? Freeform will actually run it 10 times, 10 times. Here's the parameter variation experiment. Oh, you know what? Um, probably I should say version 11 so it has the parameter variation experiment. But maybe you folks are adding it to 11. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put my version 12 up there, which includes the parameter variation experiment in case anyone wants to get that instead. And, and then they don't have to redefine it. Version 12, uh, it's up there. Uh, there it is. OK, so ladies and gentlemen, parameter variation, I could say free form varied range. How many runs is it going to run now? It's actually shown here. How many? 10. For each run right now, it's going to just use these parameter values. So you might say, well, why would it run it for 10 runs? What would be the purpose of that? Oops. It, it ran it 10 times, you could see. What would be the purpose of that, of running it 10 times? Well, in principle, it might vary from run to run. Why might it vary from run to run with the same parameter values? Why might it vary? Anyone? Why might it vary? Because of, it begins with S, T, O, stochastics. Now, if we scroll down in this parameter variation experiment, if we scroll down, we'll notice there's a randomness area. Make sure that it's set to random seed. Otherwise, it's going to rerun it again and again and again with exactly the same random number sequence. And we'll get exactly the same result unless you're depending on something externally, which is changing. So make sure it's random number C. It's generating it so each time it will be different. Very important. Are we OK with that? So having done that, you could run it again if you wanted to. But ladies and gentlemen, right now it's singularly uninteresting. It's running the model 10 times. 10 times, ladies and gentlemen, no less right now. It's creating main. It's running it to its end. 
it's destroying it, it's creating it again, running it to its end, destroying it 10 times over. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, boom. But it's not showing us any results. Let us remedy this. Let us remedy it. May we not? Thank you. Okay, so we're going to remedy this. We're going to do so in a way that leverages our existing investments, the investments on your part of blood, sweat, and perhaps tears. Okay? Ladies and gentlemen, okay, what I'd like you to do is to just go back and reflect on Maine. If you go look at Maine, you will recall that we created something called weekly incident data set, incidence data set. Do you remember that? We created it in this very room, not four hours thence. Did we not? We did, with your own hands, for many of you. Okay, we're going to make use of that data set. The difference is going to be, when we ran a traditional experiment, it would run main once, and it would show the results for main. Here, we're going to have this parameter variation experiment. It will run main not once, but many times. And each time, it needs to rest to salvage the data in here and bring it into the experiment to display it so we could see variability. So we're going to run main many times. Each time, it's going to be running to conclusion. We'll suck this out. <laughs> and we'll put it within the parameter variation experiment where it can be safeguarded until we can display it so we could see variation amongst different runs. Okay, here we go. So, back to the parameter variation experiment. We have our query, this weekly incidence data set, and now I would like to go and add in a couple things to our parameter variation experiment. Notice I'm adding these to the experiment itself, not to main and not to the, um, to the person, okay? So the first thing I would like to do is to go to that experiment and I would like to add a 2D histogram. This is from the analysis palette. 2D histogram data, this 2D histogram data object. And this will be called weekly incidence histogram 2D data. This is a histogram 2D data. Do you remember? Before you went for Starbucks, <laughs> that's interesting. Do, do you remember before you went to Starbucks? Um, um, I hope so. I <laughs> hope it wasn't that bad. Um, uh, uh, so, assuming the answer is yes, um, do you remember we created a histogram? When we, when we created that histogram. What did it depend, on what did it depend? It depended on a what? Histogram data object. Do you remember that? Mm. Here we have a 2D histogram that's going to depend on this 2D histogram data. So this is going to be where the data is stored to be displayed in a 2D histogram, okay? And I would like to set the X value range and the Y value range. The X value will go from 0 to 200. Excuse me, make it 0 to 100. It'll just be easier. 100 weeks. OK? And the number of intervals will be, for now, we'll say 50. 50 intervals. What are these intervals? Well, we're going to be dealing with a histogram, ladies and gentlemen. And histogram is broken up into bins. Is that terminology familiar? It's broken up into bins. There's a, a bin that counts the number that falls, say, 0 to 10. Another 
Those are the count, the number that fall between 10 and 20, right? These are the bins. This intervals is bins. The number of bins within this range you want to keep. Mm. Um, and here, for the y, we'd like to set it to range of 0 to, excuse me, number of intervals. Uh, we'll make it 50 as well. And we'll make it a range from 0 to the size of the population. I'm going to make it 0 to 1,000, if that's OK. We're going to make the population size 1,000 for each, each scenario. Is that OK? Mm. Uh, excuse me, excuse me. Um, maybe I, I uh, just by interest of forbearance, I think actually we'll make the population size 250. So please excuse the uh, interruption, but to avoid, to avoid causing problems, I would like to, in fact, set that from 0 to 250, OK? Just with 250, we know people are nicely connected. They're not too dense. They're not too sparse. Doing it to 1,000, we'd need to enlarge the space as well. Let's not go there. 0 to 250, OK? That will be the count of infections. This will be time, 0 to 100, and this will be the, um, the number infected at that point, OK? Um, and now, what I'd like to do is to add in, so accompany this. This is a histogram 2D data. What do you think accompanies it? A histogram 2D. There we go. A histogram 2D, ladies and gentlemen. OK? And this is going to be called weekly incidence histogram 2D. Okay, I'd like you to show bins, not envelopes. Don't worry, we're most of the way done. Envelopes will give um, quantiles or, or fractiles around the median, successive envelopes out from the median within which say 50% of the values fall, or 75%, or 90%. Bins is actually going to show the count that fall in different bins. The data here, what do you think the data is going to show? By, do you remember when we did the histogram before Starbucks? Do you remember what that depended on when we said data? I'm going to give you a hint. It's weekly incidence that's going to be shown here, weekly, uh, weekly, I'll say, incident case count. Whence is that going to come? Where does it come from? It's highlighted up in the front. What does this say? From the histogram 2D data. So it's going to come from this guy here. It's going to come from this dot weekly incidence histogram 2D data. So in short, just before Starbucks, BS, before Starbucks, we had, we had a histogram. And it depended, to get its data, it depended on a histogram data object. Here we have a histogram 2D. And it, to get its data, it depends on the histogram 2D data. And that's the one we just set up to set the x and y, the count of bins, and that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. And like in our BS world before Starbucks, we, after all, we're not the White House. Um, uh, so, you know, in, in, our, in uh, the before Starbucks work, we, um, we, were, we, were, um, we were populating that histogram data object with values. So we're going to have to do here. But here, these two are set up um, to depend on each other. Okay, And the title is going to be Weekly Incident Case Count. Um, uh, and this is the histogram data on which it depends. OK, now we're almost done. We're almost done, ladies and gentlemen. Here we go. OK, so 
What I'd like to do now is to go to the projects area, parameter variation, and I would like to set, ladies and gentlemen, the stop time to be 700. Why 700? Anyone remember? Well, it's 2D data, bless you. 2D data was from 0 to 100 weeks because it's weekly data. And therefore, in terms of days, the experiment has to run to 700 days to, to span that time. So that's one step. Secondly, what I'd like to go to do is to go to, we're just about done. We're in the cusp of greatness, ladies and gentlemen. OK, now I'd like to go in the initial experiment setup here. I would like to say the following, OK? I would like to say this dot weekly incident. We're going to clear this histogram 2D data. Do you remember we did that even before Starbucks? Even before Starbucks. Do you remember before we updated the histogram with how many people have been infected this many times or that many times cumulatively? We had to reset it. We reset, we threw out all the old data and populated anew. So we're going to say this dot weekly instant histogram data dot reset. OK, dot reset. OK, next, after simulation run, this is going to be arguably the linchpin, the key thing we're going to do. And it relates to an utterance I made, not 15 minutes thence. What was that utterance? I said, after each run of main, what do we have to do? I even made a sound to make it visceral. It sucked, sucked something out of it. And it was not my green tea latte, but, but rather we sucked out this data set. Remember that? I argued we're going to need to suck that out so we can put it in the experiment in this so it can be displayed on this histogram. And this 2D histogram, this is going to summarize the, the behavior of the model, not just over one run, but over many, many runs. Initially 10, could be 100. Might be thousands in some cases with sensitivity analysis. Mm. Ladies and gentlemen, 2D histogram, is going to be populated with data from here. So we need to insert this data from main. When we suck it out, it's going to be placed into here, into this 2D data. And this is going to summarize it in a way that displays here. How does it know to display it here? Because this depends on this guy. So all we're going to have to do is put it in there, boom. And it's going to appear here in a summarized fashion, in a 2D history. I'll explain the 2D histogram in a little bit. Ladies and gentlemen, and all that leads up to a single line of code. After simulation run, please do the following. This dot weekly incidence histogram 2D data, the same guy here, oops, weekly incidence 2D gram, not 2D, 2D data. That's this guy. Don't, don't throw it into this. It's this guy here, because this guy depends on that. Once again, data, once again, folks, we see these patterns. I, I, I do a chunk of work. It inserts a bunch of interconnected components that are wired up with each other in a certain way. Sometimes those components are not all in one place. Like here we have them in an experiment, but they suck in things from pain. Sometimes there's part of it in person, like to increment a count and the rest of the logic is in main to output and to reset it. Reset that, that variable. It's the variables there for the count. These patterns transcend any one piece of the model. 
And for, for many years, Jeff and I have advocated any logic trying to add these patterns as a unit. So you could just say, add this pattern in. It would put them in the requisite places within there. But alas, they have not acted on it yet. OK. So ladies and gentlemen, what do we need to do? What did we do? Do you remember when we populated the histogram before Starbucks? When we populated the histogram with a new piece of data, what did we do? We, remember, we looped over each person in the population, and with each person we did what? We, I know, I know what we did. We left. But we did something besides that. We added the person's count of infections into that histogram, right? OK, ladies and gentlemen, so we're going to do add. We're going to add in, and guess what we're going to add into this? I'll give you a hint. It comes with a sucking sound. What are we going to add in? We're going to add in this from main. So each time, it's going to run main, and when main is finished, in other words, after the simulation run, when main is finished, this will be fully populated with data. And we're going to suck it in, and we're going to put it into this guy here. So we're going to say add the from main, we're going to add in this thing, weekly incident data set. And the way we say main is strange, but it reflects its computer science roots. It is called root dot weekly, weekly incidents data set. That's what we do, ladies and gentlemen. That is what we do. In short, what's going to happen when we run a parameter variation experiment is it's going to run main many times. In this case, it's 10 times. For each of those runs, it is going to run main to its conclusion. It's going to suck out the weekly incident data set. It's going to put it into this 2D data. And this graph will be updated because it depends on the 2D data. It's going to then run it again. That next time, which might have very slight variation in results just because of, right now, because of stochastics, it's going to suck the results out, put them in here, and, and it's going to be updated summarization there. Why is it going to be updated automatically in this graph? Because this graph depends on this guy into which we are putting it. So this, this weekly incident 2D data is the summary mechanism for our successive data that we're layering in from each run of the model. But I talked too much, so I'd like to run it. Really, I should have built it first, just to make sure it's a happy camper. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a happy camper, happier than you and me. OK, so I'd like to run it, OK? And, and there we are. So I've run it 10 times. And we see something interesting. I'd like to run it 100 times. Maybe we'll run it 1,000 times. Can we run it 1,000 times? Is that OK? Hearing no objections, I'll say 1,000. I'm going to say run. And here we go. We'll run it. Ladies and gentlemen, you notice it's going wild. I don't, well, that's not a very good technical <laughs> description. Not very precise technical <laughs> description. <laughs> but here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, do you see it running? It's running on different cores. What that means is my machine has many cores. It's running on each of them. And, and you'll notice that there's a, there's a histogram 2D data object here. So it's actually at, at, week, at day 7, day, day 14, day 21, day 28, et cetera, it is. And it's reaching things. Um, it only is going up to to a, a hundred. Uh, that's because it's um, that's because it's uh, going um, going up to a hundred days. I should have I, I I should have been more careful here. Um, really, I should make the x-axis from not from zero to hundred, but zero to seven hundred. I'm sorry. 
because it's time 700, day 700. Not, it's not just the week. The data set actually includes the time, and there we go. I don't know if you can see that. I can see some variation. It tends to go up and then down and then sort of go almost in oscillating patterns. Can you see that? Maybe what I'll do is I'll make it a different color. Instead of making it gold, I'll make it maybe black. Oh, that's maroon. Um, here it is. There it is, black. Let's try this. Maybe that will be con high contrast. There we go. We're going to run it. Ah, that's a little bit better. Oh, I changed it in the histogram 2D data. 2D, histogram 2D data right here. Histogram 2D data, I changed it to 700. And you'll notice this is from 50 to 250. And it's kind of coarse. Um, maybe, maybe we'll have number of, of intervals be, um, uh, be maybe um, instead of 50, maybe we'll have it be uh, 250. Let's just see what it looks like for 250. It'll probably have a lot of sampling error associated with it because of small sample counts. But here you can see a little bit more detail. Ladies and gentlemen, can you see? It's, it's, not, it's not so clear because we're still only running at a modest number of runs. But, but who needs TA help? TA help? What do you need, Bryce? This one is? OK. 50, 0 to 700, and 250 bins for this guy here. OK? OK, who needs help? Who needs TA help? The TAs are on the prowl. Yes. Sure. OK. OK, I'll show you. So I'm going to run this for a larger number. I'm going to say run it for 10,000. OK, 10,000 runs of this. And I'm going to run it again and again and again, 10,000 times. It's going to be building it up and up and up, OK? So what do you see here? What do you see? Well, it's unfortunately, the screen doesn't bring it out sometimes quite as well as, a, as, a, as a, um, an actual laptop screen. But can you see there's kind of a, a dark black line along the bottom, and then there's a, uh, a, a somewhat darker region here. There's kind of a, an envelope here, and then there's a, then there's a, a sort of a low density region up top, OK? Um, so what's going on here is that um, uh, we have, and pardon me for just a second. I want to make sure we are correctly showing bins. Yes, we're showing bins. So what this is showing is the most common value for this, at any one time, the most common value is how many people infected? About zero. But there's somewhat. There's a higher density early on that there's a larger number of people infected, particularly at this time frame. There's quite a large probability there's something like up to almost 40 people infected. And then it tends to go down and then come, tends to come up. There's a possibility that up to about 60 to, well, maybe about 70 people are infected. And then the highest value is somewhere between 40 and 60 for this region. There's very, very little outside of that region for over these many, many, many runs. It's run this 10,000 times. And there's been essentially no runs where it's above 60 for these regions. Now, if we right click on this and we say copy all, you could go to your favorite spreadsheet, go to, go here to Office, go to your favorite spreadsheet, LibreOffice Calc, and, and paste into it. And here's the actual data you're dealing with. This is actually the data 
that it's summarizing. Okay? And, and I'd like to explain this. Along this axis, what do you think these are? 0 to 14, 14 to 28, 28 to 42. Those are days, summarizing sort of two-week intervals there. Why? Because we told that to only make 50 intervals. If we had made 100, then we would have done it in week-by-week -week basis. And maybe I'll I just change this to 100 in this two histogram 2D data, and I'm going to rerun it. So it's weekly. Um, but I had been running it with 50, so it was every two weeks. And it was, it was summarizing it on a two-week basis. OK, now, so these were time intervals. And these were counts of infectives. And these numbers here indicate the number of times that a, a given run fell within that interval. OK? So for example, 401 runs fell within that. Uh, they, they encountered that. I'm going to actually export this instead, because it'll be a bit easier to interpret, because it's on a weekly basis, this new one. Because now I have it weekly, 0 to 7, et cetera. Here we go. So day, ladies and gentlemen, day 0 to 7, basically everything had about one and, sorry, week zero, the very first week, no one was cumulatively infected. There's nothing. The next week, why, why is that, by the way? Because the event goes off at time zero. This event goes off at time zero, starting at time zero, and then every one week after that. At time zero, the cumulative infection count will be what? It'll be zero. The running total has been zero. It starts as zero. This running total starts as zero. So at first week, it's automatically zero. It, it, it just samples it. Um, uh, so let me get rid of this one. Don't save this. This is, ladies and gentlemen, zero to seven. Seven to 14, the highest density region is this one to two people infected after that, within that first week. But there are some runs where it has up to, it looks like the maximum is 64 people infected in the first week. Sorry, the, the second week, 7 to 14. The third week, the maximum run seems to be 65. The next week yet, the maximum seems to be at about 59. The next week at 58. The next week yet at 50. In short, what you see here is kind of an envelope where it comes down and goes up. And then there are some which, which are up here, low, low probability. So this, this somewhat darker mass you see here is kind of where it's somewhat more or a larger fraction. Okay. Now, in this case, there's not a lot of benefits by showing the bins. We can instead show the envelopes. So if you'd like to see that, one thing we could do with this, excuse me, with this parameter variation experiment, we could go to this, this component, which is the, the, the graph itself, and we could say show envelope. Do you see that? It says show envelope. This is going to show the envelopes around the mean. I'm sorry, the median. It's going to show the empirical fractiles or the quantiles around it. This is not a confidence interval. It's, it looks like an interval. It, looks, it has something to do with uncertainty. It's not a confidence interval. It's a, the fraction of runs that lay within that range. So here we're going to run it. Ah. Hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, 10,000 runs. The power of, of modern computers is being leveraged. Notice all the cores working, working hard. I actually have four cores, but there's eight virtual cores because of hyperthreading, which I won't go into in this boot camp. Um, and ladies and gentlemen, you notice these envelopes. 
where different fractions of the total fall. So there's this outer envelope, there's a next envelope, next one in, and a next one in, and you can kind of see where the median lies. It lies in there. And you can see there's this initial graph up, going down, and, and, and then up. Okay, so this is summarizing variability. Now, here's the question, ladies and gentlemen. Um, here's the question. This is a parameter variation experiment. What parameters are we varying here? Somewhat of a trick question. What parameters are we varying? What parameters are we varying? After all, we're seeing these results that, that exhibit variability. What parameters are we varying here? What parameters are we changing that's giving rise to this variability? We see considerable variability here. Some runs are getting up here, some runs down here, some runs here, some runs down here. Some runs were way down here, and some runs are way up here, and, and we have the variability. What parameters are we varying? It's a trick question. Which parameters are we varying? We're varying none. So what's going on? How can we have this degree of variability that we're seeing? If we're not changing any parameters, any assumptions about model parameters, how is it we're seeing this variability? Randomness, it's stochastics over time. But where in this model, riddle me this, where in this model, ladies and gentlemen, is there variability? Where is there any degree of, of randomness? Is there any degree of randomness here? It, are there any ways in which this is random? Yes, let us count the ways. So give me one thing that's random here. I'll give you a hint. Do you remember discussing this morning? Wherever you have a rate transition, it draws from a distribution, draws from an exponential distribution. Where is there a rate transition? Death. Is that random? Mmm, that's random. Recovery. Is that random? Yeah, it's random. Okay. What else is random? How about an internal transition? What's that transition represent? Contact, ladies and gentlemen. Contact. The occurrence of one person engaging another in a potentially transmissible way. Is that random? You bet it's random. How many times a person contacts others before they recover? Where else is there randomness? In that very transition, where else is there randomness? Send to random connected. It's sending it to one of their neighbors in the network. What else is random? Well, at the initial time, the network that was imposed was random. It depended on the vagaries of where people were placed in space. And each time it runs the model, it's going to have a different network. And each of those times, of those 10,000 runs, 10,000 runs, no less, that it ran. Each of those 10,000 runs, it's going to have a different network. Mm. Now, by the way, those, those from some backgrounds, like some health economists that have spoken with me, have been very concerned to make sure the, the network is the same every time, just they want the stochastics to differ. There's ways of achieving that. You, you have different random number of seeds used to build the network versus other things. I'm not going to go into it now, but if there's interest, I could work with you to help with that. But the basic deal is there's a lot of stochastics in this model. There's a lot of randomness even in the initial network, and then there's a lot of stochastics with the agent, agent interactions and so on, and agent transitions. So this is the result of those stochastics. Now, is there a lot of randomness here? Yeah, there's a lot of randomness. Is there any regularity here? Are there any patterns that are, that are fairly ordered and structured despite this randomness? Yeah, there are. Overwhelmingly, these models tend to have more initially than later. It tends to go, tends to go up from being, well, having none naturally in the first time because there's nothing gotten affected. It tends to be you know, somewhere between zero and high 30s uh, by the third week, and then go down. There's very little that are that high in these 
these weeks here up to about uh, day 50. Um, and then it tends to go up in a rebound and tends to come down. There's almost none that are very high in this later time. There's a lot of regularity here. There's a lot of hidden order. Despite the random, despite the randomness, it's not just all over the place and who knows what's going to go on. No, there's, there's structure here. There's, there's, there's regularities coming out of this model. But just stochastics. This type of, if you have a stochastic model, which is typical for agent-based models, you want to perform this sort of summary to see the impact of randomness. But that's not where we stop, ladies and gentlemen. That's not where we stop. So what I'm going to do is I am just going to, to, to save ourselves worry, I'm going to actually rename this from parameter variation to um, stochastic uh, variability. Stochastic variability. Uh, and I'll call it PV for parameter variation experiment, just to denote. So we're not varying any parameters. I didn't want to call it a parameter variation. But now, ladies and gentlemen, we'll copy this. We'll paste in. And so I'm, I'm duplicating that experiment. And now I'll call parameter variation because now we are going to examine the effects of parameter variation. Okay, now, ladies and gentlemen, let us engage in varying parameters, okay? We are going to click here on varied in range, and we're going to specify possible values for parameters to change, okay? So here we go. We're going to go here to do varied in range. You notice when I vary in range, it, it, it actually grays out this number, in range, number of runs because we're not going to tell it how many runs. It's going to tell us what's implied by the variation. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to vary some parameters and see how they affect things. I'd like to change the mean duration of infection and mean duration of immunity. Is that okay? Are we okay with that? Thank you very much. Okay. So, mean duration of infection. I would like to change it from 10 to 50 with a step of 10. But in order to do that, I can't type this in. What do I have to do? I told you earlier, but you may have forgotten. What do I have to do? Yeah, I have to change it from fixed to range. So now I could say from 10 to a maximum of 50, step 10. So I'm going to systematically vary this assumption over there. Maybe I won't do it step 10. I'll do it step 5. So it'll be 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50. Hmm? Hmm. Are we okay with that? Okay. So ladies and gentlemen, let's run it. Ba boom. Hmm. Hmm. We've seen, as we change that, 10 is the minimum. You notice there's something interesting going on here. Where is the median now? Let's say you're 600. Where's the median? It's actually well above zero. It's more like 10 or something like that. Um, it's, it's somewhere in this region, the median. That's the, the darkest place. And then coming up. By the way, why am I saying? So these empirical fractiles, where those empirical quartiles which are showing these different gray levels, where are those set? Those are set over here in parameter variability. By the way, I duplicated this, right? I, I 
copied and pasted it. And if we go and we look at this, you can set the envelopes. So the innermost, the black ones, 25% of the, of the samples fit within the little black range here. The next gray level out, next lighter gray is, is 0.5. The next one yet is 0.75. Okay? Are we okay with that? Okay. So, so that's why we see this. You can change these. If you want to say, I want to do 0.95 as well, you could do that and you would see somewhat different results, okay? Um, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. I, I screwed up. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Oh, man. Well, yeah, I should have done that modification here in parameter variation, not in stochastic variability, but it doesn't hurt. It's in stochastic variability. Um, I'm going to upload my model for you to share in case anyone would like to, is having trouble, they can catch up here. So I'm going to um, call it version 13. I'm going to upgrade to version 14. It's going to be the one I'm going to be, on which I'm going to be working. And I will upload, as we speak, version 13 to you. Ladies and gentlemen, it is uploaded. Okay. Okay. So parameter variation, I could run it. And you'll notice here, I'm running this. And if I run it, it says nine runs. Why nine? I thought I had told it before 10,000. And it even shows 10,000. Why is it only nine? Yeah. 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40. You total them up, it's, it's, it's nine. Hmm? Nine. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that's varying that parameter alone mm, over that range. Let's suppose we instead wanted to do mean duration of immunity as well. A two-way, that's a one-way sensitivity analysis, additively changing that. Let's suppose we wanted to do mean duration of immunity um, between, its fixed value was 30, Let's suppose we want to do it from 30 up to 100, step 10. How do you think that will change things? Now we have two things varying, don't we? Two things, ladies and gentlemen. Let's, let's engage in it. Yeah. There we go. 72. Yeah, it's... it's one off there. Yeah. So, um, so ladies and gentlemen, now we see there's actually a much larger number at zero. Why might there be zero? Well, the longer you make immunity, the longer it is till someone recovers. And if they don't, rec sorry, go back to susceptible. If no one goes back to susceptible for a long time, it can die out. So here we have this variability induced by that. We still see patterns, but there's a lot of zeros here. Okay. And once again, we can export this if we wanted to do so and put it in a, a spreadsheet. Okay. With it, it's what? Oh, good point. Good point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Excellent point by Refat. We're kind of using too much of a big range. Let's do it between, are people okay doing it between 0 and 60? Recognizing there are a few above 60. Can we do it between 0 and 60? Is that okay? At least we should do it between 0 and 100. Okay, so let's do that. Where would we going to change that? Suppose we wanted to change it to go from not 0 to, to 100 or 250, but 0 to, 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 six, to 40. Where would we do it? We Histogram data. So the y intervals, excuse me, the x intervals here to be zero. Let's make it 60, and we'll make it um, 60 of them. Is that okay? Yeah, 60. There we go. So let's run. Mmm. Mmm. More insightful, thanks to Refut. Ladies and gentlemen, what is this innermost one? What's the envelope associated with that? 
25%. 25% of the runs lie within this envelope. The next larger one, what fraction of them lie within it? 50%. The next larger yet, 75. The next larger yet, 95. And I think this is all, the outermost. Okay, So 1, 2, 3, 4. Maybe it's uh, just those four. Okay, 95%. At, at, at this time, so ladies and gentlemen, a good way to think about this is, this result, if you slice it here, let's suppose we sliced it at time 200, what you would see is a, is a distribution here. And actually, it's better if you treat it as bins, but these are envelopes around it. If you really want to talk about the distribution, you should be showing the bins, not the envelopes. But basically, if you slice it here, there's uh, a distribution. I'm going to get it to show bin counts instead. Not, not envelopes, but bin counts. Because that's really appropriate for the distribution. The count that fall in bins. This is like an empirical histogram. OK, there we go. OK, now that's, that's pretty interesting. That's a different picture. Mm. Trying to, trying to puzzle that one out. Um, so I guess there's a fair number here. That's, that's really interesting. Um, it's a bit different looking than I anticipated. Let's, let's try pasting it in. OK, zero this day. OK, there are quite a few here, but there's an even larger number collectively above. I see. Yeah, Collectively, there's a, a much larger number above here. Um, OK, um, and so of these runs, which are 72 in number, you can see that, oops, sorry. You can see that, let me close this. The largest number fell here. The, the plurality, the largest single bin was here, but most of them fell above there. And so the median is somewhere above here. Mm -hmm. But this is the actual history. This is indicative of the empirical history of So if I were to cut it at, at day 200, if I were to cut it at this day here, I would actually have a histogram. Where would it be a peak? Where's the peak? Where's the mode of that histogram? Where's the single highest value? At 0 to 1. And then it goes down, and then there's some little very increase here and down, and it's a bit higher, then it goes down for, and then up. And there's some sampling vary, but then it goes down, and there's a little peak there, and then all the way. So if you were to cut it and look at it at the side, you'd see a histogram. And these are the different bins. So this, this darkness is counting the number of runs of these 72 whose results fell within time whatever it is, 200, 200 some odd to 200 some odd plus 7, it fell, it, the, the, the count of infectives fell within that range. So it's at time, roughly 200, some had as many as 23 or so. Some had many, the single largest count was between 0 and 7. I'm oh, sorry, 0 and um, uh, zero and one, and then uh, some had somewhat more, et cetera. Okay, so that's a that's an empirical history. I'm as we're varying just those two parameters. Okay, um, and if you want to see the effects, okay. Now this is important, ladies and gentlemen. So let me refine this further. If you want to see the effects of stochastics as well, how many times is it running each of those parameter values? Let's Let's, let's, let me just ask you. So I'm running these. Boom. 72. How many times is it running? For each combination, it's generating each combination of value. It's what we call the Cartesian product in physics. Each combination of possible values. Actually, it's called that in mathematics as well. So each possible combination of values. So value 10 here and 30 here. Value 15 here and 30 here. Value 20 here and 30 here. And each possible combination, you know, all the way up, and, and then 
30, uh, 40, and 50, et cetera. Each possible combination. How many times is it running each of those? Once. That's why it's only 72. Suppose I wanted, because of stochastics, to run it many times for each of those. Then what I could do, ladies and gentlemen, is change that to run it with replications. This is realizations. It will run it many times for each possible combination of parameter values. And let's suppose I want to run it 10 times for each, or let's say 20 times for each. Are we okay with that? Say 20 times for each. Let's run it now. Now it's going to run it how many times? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Good man, good man. Um, 1,440. She's hit it on the button. 72 times 20. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, here we get the stochastic variability with it, too. And we see, OK, as we're varying these parameters, we can see, OK, um, most of the values lead within this. Some are as high as this. But it gives a bounding for how far things change as you vary the parameter value. So what you learn is quite a few lead to zero. In short, quite a few lead to the infection dying out because there's zero to one infected. Okay. Um, I think it's exactly, it's, it's zero. Okay. okay. So ladies and gentlemen, that's varying two parameters at once. Um, but let's talk about this uh, a little bit more more uh, substantively. You notice you can get things changing quite a bit. We could perform one way. We could perform multi-way. Um, uh, and, uh, and you know here we could examine combinations. The challenge of this is there's a combinatorial explosion, meaning suppose we want to examine, say, one parameter into 10 different possibilities. So we wanted to, suppose we were to go and say, OK, we want to examine 10 different possibilities for this mean duration of infection. Fine, 10 different runs. Maybe each of them we run 20 times for stochastics. Two parameters, 10 possibilities for one, 10 for the other, 100 possibilities. Maybe each of them run 20 times. Three parameters, 10 for the first, 10 for the second, 10 for the third, 1,000 possibilities, each run 20 times. Four parameters, 10,000, each 20 times. It starts to blow up. It starts to grow really large. And if you have a large number of different parameters, it can be prohibitive to really explore the space. Now, there's several ways about dealing with this. And it behooves you to, to conduct several things. This is important as a, as a principle. Number one, perform one-way sensitivity analyses and figure out which parameters it's most sensitive to. Some of the parameters in the range that it's exploring around the values of other parameters Varying some parameters within that range will make very little difference. Some will make a much bigger difference. Identify the parameters that make the biggest difference. And if you're going to examine multi-way, go for those. That's one way to, to deal with it. It's imperfect because, after all, its sensitivity to one might depend on the value of the others. After all, what's supposed to mean duration? Of, of immunity is very long. Let's suppose 100. It might not really matter at all what the mean duration of infection is because, well, within broad ranges we're examining, because basically the infection is going to die out after someone's, uh, someone's recovered, and it's only going to spread once, and then that's going to be it. In short, the values of one parameter may make the values of the other somewhat irrelevant, or may emphasize them, it may accentuate them. Um, so sometimes looking for default values of other parameters and examining only one 
uh, allows you to miss, miss some important interactions. But it is one way to do it. Another way is uh, through a technique known as dimensional analysis. This is underutilized these days by modelers, but it's very powerful. And fundamentally, it allows you to identify not, not parameters to vary, but combinations of parameters to vary in kind of an independent way that yields independent results. And actually can reduce, say, maybe from 10 parameters to 4 or something like that or to 5. Because you, you actually explore dimensionless parameters. Physicists do this a lot. But it's somewhat of a loss art elsewhere in engineering these days, I fear. But basically what you're doing is you're, you're in a really savvy way changing things that are independent of one another. Because like if we change the population size, we're not just changing population size. We're also changing the density of the population. So really here what we should be changing is not population size. It, it'll be sort of like ratio of area to population size. We, 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 we change the density, for example, by itself. Or we change the population size jointly with the space size so that we're not changing density. We're just changing population size. There are ways by dimensional analysis that you can identify ways of changing some so that they have least change to other things. Basically, so they, they, you're changing one thing, a, a, a set of quantities at a time in a consistent way that the model um, will, be, uh, will be able to be probed with a minimum number of such dimensionless quantities. I'm not explaining it well at the moment. But I could come back to it if there were interest. The second thing is we have these techniques, which are, are really quite neat, for selecting combinations. Um, yeah, so th this is this dimensional analysis. And the, for the, the point here is with dimensional analysis is a formal procedure you can go through to recognize dimensionless quantities that are of interest. And this can significantly reduce the parameter count by a, quite a large amount if you have a smaller number of parameters. The second technique is you select parameters judiciously um, in one of two forms, Latin hypercubes and orthogonal arrays. Latin hypercubes, basically, you, you have each parameter, each value of it is guaranteed to be explored once. Or for continuous parameters, each certain range, like a range of bounded by, say, uh, 0 to 10, 10 to 20. 20 to 30, et cetera, you guarantee that for each parameter, at least for one, for one experiment, one run within the parameter variation run, you've tried each possible range of values it could hold. Um, and, and so you guarantee, as you explore things, that at least if you explored all possible ranges of that parameter, or, or for discrete values, for integer values, all possible values, let's say, of it. For orthogonal arrays, it takes it one step further. It's, it's one step stronger guarantee. You test each pair of parameter values at least once. So if you have three different parameters, A, B, and C, not only do you explore each possible range of values for A, each possible range of values for B, and each possible range of values for C, you explore pairs of these. So each possible range of values for A paired with each pair of, um, uh, of ranges of values for B. Each pair of uh, values for A with each pair of values for C. Each of B with each of C. But you don't explore all possible combinations of, of ranges together. Rather, you have pairwise these distinct ranges. And this is a very powerful technique. Um, uh, Latin hypercube sampling is sometimes analogized to these uh, uh, medieval um, pastime among mathematicians of finding Latin squares. And it's illustrated here. Um, uh, so, so say for this yellow, what you see, this is an illustration in Caius College in uh, Cambridge, um, uh, celebrating the work of uh, uh, the famous mathematician uh, Fisher. Some of you know through the, stat through the statistics named after him. Um, uh, so Ronald Fisher, famous statistician in the early uh, 20th century. And you'll notice for 
for yellow, yellow appears. Th does anyone notice a property for yellow? I'll just put it that way. What's the property that's guaranteed, say, for yellow? It appears what? Does it appear in each row? How many times does it appear in each row? Once. How many times does it appear in each column? Once. And so the analogy here is, for a given parameter, at least in your experiments, you've guaranteed at one time that you sampled from each range of that parameter can hold. So you haven't neglected fully all its small values. You haven't neglected entirely all its large values. At least once you've sampled from each range. And similarly is for parameter B. Maybe red, for example. Does red appear in each row? Yeah, it does. Does it appear in each column? Yeah, it does. But it doesn't appear more than once in each column or once in each row. And so the idea here is we have a kind of a minimal set that explores for each parameter considered in isolation, each of its possible ranges of values, explores each of those and each of those exactly once, once and exactly once. Mm. Um, and it turns out Latin hypercubes take this out of the sphere of squares, of two dimensions, to n dimensions. Okay? Um, this is somewhat of a, it's, it's a very efficient technique because we're guaranteed to have at least one sample of each possible value of each parameter and no more than one. But we, we miss some pairwise effects. Orthogonal arrays is actually a technique known in software testing. You test uh, software using orthogonal arrays, and I teach it in my class on software, software engineering and software project management. So here, we have each pair of possible values of the parameter. So, so not only do we guarantee that each parameter has each possible range of values sampled, but each pairwise um, with, with others. So we have when A is high and B is uh, high, A is high and B is low, A is high and B is medium. A is medium and B is low, high, medium. C, uh, sorry, A is, is, is high and, 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 and vice versa, et cetera. So each possible pair of values for each possible pair, pair of variables. But we do not have each possible combination of all possible variables. It's a very clever technique that requires some thinking how to achieve. The good news is that there's automatic generators for this. You can get it to automatically generate these orthogonal arrays, or for that matter, Latin hypercubes. Now you may say, does any logic support this? Directly, no. But given that there's external generators, all you do is you can import a file that has these possible pairs of values in them, generated externally. And then what you do is you just go through each row of that file. It says, for this variable, assume this. For this other, this parameter, assume this. This other parameter, assume that. This other parameter, assume that. And any logic does allow that, that you use, and I'll show you where, in any logic, here. Um, here we go. In any logic, um, you could have, instead of varying just these parameter values, you could vary something called hy hypercube index from 0, say, to 200, the number of entries in the hypercube. And then, for each of these parameters, you could assume a value as given by that index from that table you've looked up. Okay? And so basically what you can do is you can have in place here, in a freeform fashion, an expression here that ends up depending on looking it up in a table, looking it up in a table of the Latin hypercube or orthogonal array. And so then you could assume values for each of these parameters that are as specified by this orthogonal array or as specified by this Latin hypercube imported into 
into the parameter variation experiment, or into the, the model in the parameter variation experiment. So in short, any logic does not directly support these Latin hypercubes or orthogonal rays. It doesn't automatically generate them, but you can use external generators that will. You can read them in, and you can have any logic's parameter values for your model look up what their value should be for the current round from that table that you've imported and assume that appropriate value. And it works very effectively. It explores it in a, in a thorough way, particularly in the case of orthogonal arrays. Okay. Um, another technique that can readily be done is to use what is called Monte Carlo analysis. Now, Monte Carlo analysis, as some people will recognize from its more general name, involves randomly selecting the values of interest. Okay? So, for example, here, if we say freeform, for mean duration of infection, we could draw a value, say, uniformly uniformly between 10.0 and 30.0, okay? And what this is going to do is it's going to run for each of these, say, 1,000. It's going to run this, and it's going to draw a value here. And same thing with mean duration of immunity. I could draw it with uniform between, whoop, uniform between 30 and 50. This is going to draw it from a continuous distribution. I could do it with a normal distribution, although you'd want to use a truncated normal so it doesn't go negative. Mm -hmm. So a minimum or a maximum of zero in that thing. Now, if I were to do that and I were to go run this thing, that's the parameter variation experiment. I were to go run it. Here we go. Ba boom. Good question. Yeah. Yep. Fair enough. What this does is it runs the model many, many, many times to summarize the results. Like if, if, if you had those. Yeah, that's correct. Well, sort of. I mean, in other words, like normally when we have an experiment where we'd specify the values for, to assume for parameters in main is in the experiment, right? Right, but the problem is those values are specified in the experiment itself. So I'm, you know, when I go to run the model, either you put those parameters. So, so I guess the question is, if these are parameters in main, somewhere their value has to be set. You could set them in an experiment to be drawn from a uniform distribution, but it's only going to run it once. Um, I guess maybe what you're saying is the default values for those parameters will say draw it from this distribution, something like that. Yeah. 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 Oh, that would be fine. Oh, oh, yeah. No, that would be fun. That's another way of accomplishing this. But, but the reason I, I had actually mentioned that earlier, that I'm avoiding depending on it because it's not in PLE. So, so, yeah, what I'm showing is some of what I'm showing would be accomplished with sensitivity analysis here in a slightly simpler way, some with the Monte Carlo option. 
Um, but you're, you're, you're right. You could do it in a Monte Carlo uh, context, for sure. This is just another way to achieve that without depending on having a more expensive version running on top. Yeah. So here, ladies and gentlemen, we're running it again and again and again with these drawn from this distribution. And it's some, it, you could see it summarizing these results with these. And you'll notice I'm displaying the bins here. OK? This is showing, excuse me, bins. And here you can see there's kind of a, it's kind of bimodal. There's a high bin here. It goes down. Then there's another mode up here. Can you see that? It's high here. The mode here. The mode is here. Goes down and then it comes up again and then goes down. Um, so there's another peak in short. Um, for example, up here, it's a, there's a higher peak down, secondary peak going down and progressively less and es essentially zero there. By drawing these things from this Monte Carlo distribution. Now, what the Monte Carlo di distribution doesn't give you is any sort of guarantees about having explored it thoroughly. That's why it's a different option. You're not doing this Latin hypercube or orthogonal array. If you want to do Latin hypercube or orthogonal array, you can do so by looking it up, as I said, within that. Um, and the basic way in which you do that um, is, is you can you know, uh, index, you can have an index going through one by one, zero, one, two, three, four, and you look it up in a table. Um, and you end up um, looking it up in this, uh, in this table. So this is exploring possible values, but it doesn't guarantee that you've explored each possible combination of them. But the strength of it is you could explore, you know, different distributions, for example. So maybe I want to do a max of, um, of, you know, no less than five, and it's between, um, let's say, uh, a normal distribution between with a, uh, a, mean, a standard deviation, a sigma of uh, 10, uh, and a mean value of, of um, 10.0, okay? Uh, max, because I don't want it to be less than five, okay? Um, that's going to be a truncated normal, and I could run it. And so now I'm, I'm varying it based on some, uh, uh, some theory here. I'm varying it with a, uh, with a certain range, and now I can see a rather different result. You don't have that really secondary peak of any significance here. Um, and it's running it 1,000 times. With each of those 1,000 times running it 20 times from the number of replications, and for mean duration of infection, it's a truncated normal. For mean duration of immunity, it's from this uniform distribution. It's utilizing all the cores. By the way, I understand from Cheryl, Winchell, um, and maybe Wade, who I think all of whom are out of the room at the moment, maybe attending to their posters, um, that in 8.3.2, it does not efficiently utilize these processors. That's one of the reasons we didn't use it for, for this part. Um, but I'm sure that's probably something any logic will be fixing. But you'll notice that, that we said 1,000 times and each of them 20. So it's going to run 20,000 runs here. Okay? And there it's done. Okay? So, so here, this is Monte Carlo analysis. And Cheryl's exactly right. If you have recourse to, the, to a, a more... Uh, a more upscale version of any logic, um, you can do new experiment Monte Carlo and do it somewhat e more easily. Somewhat more easily. Um, and the same thing with comparing runs or performing sensitivity analysis. It makes it easy to do some of these tasks that we've done by hand. But I've shown how to build them up by hand. Okay. Um, uh, so those are some uh, some comments here. Um, 
I will say as the number of parameters goes up, the ability to explore um, in a grid type of fashion, all, all possible ranges of values really tightly, goes up geometrically, absent Latin hypercube or orthogonal array or other techniques. Whereas in Monte Carlo techniques sample very nicely from the different distributions. Um, and they actually sample more finely from, and they sample from the highly probable regions uh, very well, whereas coarser grids tend to spend, doing it in a grid-wise fashion, tends to spend a lot of work in sort of low probability areas of, of space. So you can, you can conduct these things quite, uh, quite readily. Um, okay, um, a couple more points and then we're gonna break for the poster session. So, what, so there's a couple points I'm gonna make about sensitivity analysis. One thing is sometimes we wanna perform analysis with respect to the initial state. We don't know the value of the initial state and we wanna examine how sensitive the model is to the assumption of the initial state. We haven't seen anything of significance in setting the initial state, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to, like to show you in any logic how we could change that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to save this version 15 to the, version 14 to the site, if anyone would like to grab it. And I'm gonna make a slight modification that's gonna teach an important principle that's very commonly used, okay? Version 14 is up there, if anyone would like to, to see it, okay? Version 15, what I'm going to do is I'm gonna to go to person, and I'm going to do something a little bit different than what you've seen. It's gonna teach two principles. First, it's gonna teach a new type of construct for state charts. It's a very important concept. Construct, I, I feel almost a sense of guilt not having revealed it to you thus far, because it's actually really important for many models. The second thing it's gonna show you a very how to address with that construct a very important need. To wit, the ability to start people in different states. You'll notice here, if we look at this, these state charts, where do people start with respect to infection? Where does everyone in the population start? And susceptible until one person gets sent. Do you remember we had a, a little um, initial infection thing here, remember that? And there's some really sweet code to generalize that for 10 different people. Boy, is it sweet code. It's just gorgeous. And if you'd like, I could show it to you at some point. Um, just make sure you don't, don't faint over it, the beauty. Okay. Um, but if, unless you're a software engineer, it's unlikely you will. Okay. Um, I'm, I might swoon for it. <laughs> So we got it, maybe I'll show it to you with my eyes closed. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, um, so what we're gonna do is to, to remedy this, so not everyone starts here. Some start here, some start there. We wanna divide people up to start in different states. How would we do that? We turn to the palette. We go to either a state chart or to, to uh, agent. And, oh, sorry, we're not gonna drag a state. We're gonna drag a branch in. Hmm? Ladies and gentlemen, a branch, no. A branch, I tell you, a branch. And when, then we're gonna drag in transitions from that branch to the three different states. Ladies and gentlemen, all three. Now, this model, what this model has gained in functionality, it's lost in aesthetics. So I'm going to engage in aesthetic prettification, if that's okay. I'm gonna prettify it some. I, I don't hear any strong objections, so I'll proceed with alacrity, okay? Um, there, there we go, uh, sorry, sorry, I, I need to, sorry, my engineer side comes through. Okay, um, okay. Ladies and gentlemen, you notice all of these are dotted. They shouldn't be dotted. Dotted means what? Anyone know? What does dotted mean? 
It's the default. So we're going to make the others depend on a condition. So for each branch, it's going to be default if none of the conditions are true. But there's going to be here, because it goes to three possibilities, there's going to be the default and two other possibilities. And if each of those other possibilities falls, it is, is not realized, we're going to go to the default. OK? OK. We're cooking with gas. We have about 10 minutes. 10 minutes, ladies and gentlemen, that separates you from the Oculus. <laughs> OK? OK. Here we go. Um, oculi. OK? Um, OK, so ladies and gentlemen, um, what I'd like to do, we need to divide people up into these different states. Could I show you a sweet way to do it? Or <laughs> you don't want me to show you like an ugly way to do it? OK, good. Thank you. Thank you for sparing me this. OK, so ladies and gentlemen, I would like to go, I would like to, go to the project, and I would like to add in something of which you've remained innocent from the first the, the afternoon of the first day. I'd like to add in an option list. Does anyone remember what an option list is? It encodes what? Possibilities. So we're going to say initial infection state is the name of this, this op set of possibilities. These are categorical possibilities. An options list lists categorical possibilities. Different nominal outcomes. For those who speak Java, it's kind of an enum secretly, but don't, don't worry about it. You don't know what that means. OK. Um, these are the different possibilities. OK. The first one is going to be susceptible state. Notice I'm giving them slightly different names in these states by because I don't want them to get confused. Infective state. Normally, there, there's not a clash, but with, with someone who, who's who doesn't know their way around it that much, they might get confused, understandably, seeing a name. Oh, oh gosh, did I, I canceled it. I'm sorry. OK, let me, let me do it again, which will give you time to check, catch up. OK, this is going to be, what did I call it? Uh, initial infect, infection state. OK, I'm going to call it susceptible state. I'm going to call it infective state. And I'm going to call it recovered state. OK? And I'm going to say finish. OK, now this list, what are these lists? They list which state people fall in. Are we OK with that? OK, now, now we have to engage in some quick frobbery. OK? OK. Ladies and gentlemen, um, what I'd like to do is I'd like to add to person a parameter. A parameter, ladies and gentlemen, no less. A parameter. And the parameter is going to be called initial infection state. OK? Initial infection state. And what is its type going to be, do you think? If we scroll down, what is its type going to be? Initial infection. What is this? This is the option list. So basically, it's going to, this parameter will encode one of those three possibilities. Susceptible state, infective state, recovered state. In short, we're going to tell this person when they get created, this is the state in which you'll start. And what state do you think babies will start? Well, I know there's vertical transmission, so I don't want to minimize that. But in our model, we'll start them in a susceptible state. Okay? Um, there's some terrible, um, terrible cases where you know, babies can, can, um, can be infected, say, with HIV from the mother. Um, but, but here we're going to assume they start in a um, susceptible state. Ladies and gentlemen, this is going to carry that value. And what do we need to do 
So, so that's great. Mm -mm. Now, where? Tell me. I know I've repeated this many times, but I do so with with pedagogical intentions. If a parameter is in main, what is it that that dictates the value of that parameter, communicates it to main? It's the experiment. Remember, that's why we can set with different experiments different assumptions about main. That allows us to undertake controlled experiments, each independent. Um, we can run the model with different assumptions by using different values of parameters. If a parameter's in person, what, where is it we set the value of it and communicate it to the agent? Well, the experiment creates main. That's why it sets the value and passes it on. What is it that creates a person? Yeah, the population, and then two other places. We have immigration and birth. So let's, let's draw our attention to that, OK? I'm, I'm, I'm mindful of the countdown to the Oculus. OK, here we go to the population. We're going to go to initial infection state. Oh, sorry. OK, we're going to go to in initial infection state. What state should we put people in initially? Well, we could say everyone's susceptible, but that's just the point. We want to escape that. So what do we need? Suppose we want to start some people susceptible, some people infected, and some people, ladies and gentlemen, recovered. What can we do? We could draw their initial infection state from a what? Begins with a D, ends with an N, distribution. So, so how do we add a distribution? Well, we can go to the agent. And what do we drag in? What is this? A custom distribution. OK. So this is going to be initial infection, initial infection state distribution. Is that OK? Some might want to call it distrib if you don't like my long names. With autocomplete, I don't think long names hurt that much. And they communicate intention. But you know, there's reasonable disagreements about whether to abbreviate things. I think for the Australians, you know, they they like to abbreviate things some, and and so they can use shorter names. So though Jeff tells me they often abbreviate and then they add like an O at the end, you know, um, yeah. Mm. So it shortens it, but then sometimes you add a little a little thing at the end. I'm going to eat my brekkie. You know, um, yeah. Um, OK, so la ladies and gentlemen, initial infections, what sort of distribution is this going to be? It's going to be a what? Continuous, discrete, or options? Options, ladies and gentlemen. What's the option list from which it will draw initial infection state? OK, let's suppose we want. 95% of the people to be in the susceptible state. You can make it 0.95 if you want. It's all relative. Um, maybe we want 3% um, to be in the infective state initially and 2% in the recovered state. Is that OK? OK. So this is our distribution. Whence we'll draw the, um, draw the values. OK. Back, back to the population. How are we going to determine the initial infection state? Where are we going to get it? Well, look what we did here. What are we going to do here? We need to, what is, what is initial infection state? That's, that's the parameter in person. What sort of parameter is it? It's a member of the option list. Where can we draw a member of the option list? Maybe, maybe from a distribution. What, what are we going to draw this from? The initial infection state distribution. Initial infection state distribution. Boom. By the way, as, as was noted earlier by Claire, you noted once again it says double. Ignore the, that stuff. I don't know, mumble. It, they just didn't update their documentation, I think. Although, I think those Java docs should be auto-generated, but. OK. We draw from the distribution. OK. 
so we set that. Now some people are going to, in the model, begin in different states, right? Okay, where else do we need to do it though? Where else do we create people? In the immigration. For immigrants, for immigrants, how do we specify their parameter values? Well, remember it's specified when we add them to the population. So, for example, here, if we do add population, look at this. Now it's asking not just for one parameter, birth time, it's asking for initial infection state. How does it know to ask for each of those? What are those? Those are assumptions for each of its what? Each of its parameters. When we create a person to add them to the population, it behooves us to provide them, to tell us what to assume for each of their parameter values. For their birth time, we already derived the parameter value to assume. Remember, we had it before, birth time and days. Well, how are we going to get the value of initial infection state? Maybe we'll draw it from this initial infection distribution. But you know, um, Canada, and I'm sure Australia too, and US, often they, their immigrants are screened for certain types of infectious diseases, say TB, before they immigrate. And so you might argue it's a somewhat different distribution. But because we're over time, I'm going to draw it from the initial infection distribution. I'll assume the immigrants coming in are, are from a, a similar sort of characteristics as the rest of the population at the initial time. So I'm going to draw it from the initial uh, state distribution. So what is this telling? This is saying, hey, add someone to the population whose birth time and days is given by this, so that they're currently this age, and their initial infection distribution is given by this. So that's one place people are added to the model other than population. Population takes care of adding the initial population, this guy here. Immigration takes care of adding the immigrants. Where else are people added to this model? Where else? Births. I heard him muttering, birth, ladies and gentlemen. There's the birth process. OK, for the baby, it's birth time. We need to specify both parameters again. It's looking for both parameters, the birth time and the initial distribution. What are we going to assume for birth time? Well, it's the current time. The baby is born at the current time. What are we going to assume for initial state? We're going to assume. Yeah, that, that they're susceptible. Now, what did I call that? Susceptible state, I called it. What's this susceptible state thing? Well, it's the name I, I gave in that option list. OK, TA stand ready. Once more into the breach. It was from this susceptible state in that. So in short, when a baby is born, we're going to assume it's susceptible. Do you see that? You see that? OK. Susceptible state. OK. Ladies and gentlemen. Susceptible state. And now we're done with the thought. I'd like to, to run this. And we should see, well, you know, right now it's not great for demonstrating it. Because there's a, there's a really large, oh, wait, you have to build. OK, it's, it's reporting a problem. I didn't see it because the problems went up. Branch cannot be, oh, don't tell me that. Oh, man, I double click and it brings me to the code. Very likely this is a sign that any logic has to close the model and open it. Sorry, folks. It, it seems to be confused. Um, this, is, this is distressing, but it's not an unknown thing. Unless I have something not connected here, I'm just making sure everything is green. Green is the color and state charts of the game. OK, all these are connected, but it's still unhappy. So I'm going to close this model, close, and I'm going to reopen it. There we go. OK, is it happy? My hypothesis is it's just the model, any logic got in a whacked out state. It's fine now. So. The thing is, the initial infection distribution, we'll have to go through a lot of people to find one infective. So if, I'm, if it's OK with you, 
temporarily I'm going to boost up the number of infectives just so we'll see them easily. I'll come back and delete it, okay? I'm going to say 30 um, here. They don't add up to 100, but that's fine. It just will normalize it appropriately. It's risk relative to values. So I'm going to say, okay. Oh, look, look, a lot. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. A lot started infected. How could I? Ah, this is a, Oh, my gosh. Alas, poor microphone. I knew him well. Um, this was a microphone bought after considerable walking and searching in Melbourne. Joanne Atkinson at Sachs calls it my Dalek. Um, if any of you are Doctor Who fans, um, um, it, it may now be past expiration, but we'll see. Um, it may have been exterminated. Um, <laughs> inner joke there. Um, okay, ladies and gentlemen, if I wanted to just start this model, just start it. So I just want to see it at the initial state. I don't want to advance it many time units. I just want to start it. One thing you could do is this. All you do is this. See this little thing step? Watch this. I do step. Then it becomes time zero. It, it has done nothing except initialize things. I go and I view the model. Oh my gosh, everyone's infected. Something is wrong. The initial infection state distribution. Wait a minute. Here we go. 30, 95, so, so what's going on? Oh, of course. I, my first hypothesis is maybe I, maybe I had said 30, the other was 0.95. That was my running hypothesis, that maybe I gave the wrong distribution. But no, that's right. So most of the people should be what? Susceptible, but they're not. OK, now I develop another hypothesis. My hypothesis is we didn't finish the thought. And I realized, of course, we didn't finish the thought. Go to person. What's missing here? This is the default. This is a condition. What's the condition? True. To go to recovered. And, and the condition for this is true. No, we don't want that. What should the condition be here? Well, to go to the infective state, what should initial infection state be? This dot initial infection state, only if it's what should they go to the infection state? Infective state. So in other words, ladies and gentlemen, we're telling the person, when you start up, go to this initial infection state. And it says, yes, ma'am. And so if this thing is is actually holds the value. If we give it the value, we draw the value from that distribution, we give it the value infective state, we'll have it go to the infective transition. Okay? And I'll call it initial infective uh, transition. Okay? Similarly, what should the condition be for this? Under what condition would we go to recovered? Yeah. This dot initial infection state equals what? Double equals recovered state. That's when they'd be recovered. This one, initial infection state, double equals infection. So under this condition, if we tell them, create them, and their initial infection state is infective state, as drawn from that distribution out here, as drawn from this, this distribution, infective state. Um, if, their, if their initial infective state is said to be infective state, where will they go? To infective. If they're told to initially go to recovered, they'll go to recovered. Otherwise, they'll go where? Susceptible, if otherwise. OK, so now let's run it. Now we've finished the thought, actually. Let's, let's run it out. Ah, did you see that? Let's let's run it. Just just get it to the to its initial place. All we have to do is this: advance it to time zero. Switch. Ah. Nine. 
So I would, I would conjecture without proving it that the distribution is roughly 95 to 30 to 2 here, or, you know, with roughly those proportions. I'm going to change effective state back to, to 3%. I'm going to run it again. Here we go. And I'm going to advance it to time 0. Do you see that? Advancing it to time 0 is a good trick. It lets us see the initial state without saying, whoa, it ran too fast. We're already past the horses out of the barn. The horse is through the gate. OK, yeah, we have a, we have a, you know, a handful of infectives. That looks about right. Has anyone recovered? Yeah, these two are recovered. These two, yeah. There's a handful, and most people are, are, are susceptible. Why? Because we said this distribution, just to go through the logic again, we said that each person is going to be told what their initial state is. That initial state will be encoded by this option list. We're going to tell them what their initial state is, and based on what we tell them in that parameter, they're going to be routed to the initial state, either to recovered, or to infective, or to susceptible. Now, when we create them, we're going to tell them what their initial state is. And to help with that, for the initial population and, and immigrants, we're going to be drawing it from this distribution. So for the initial population, we draw from this distribution. For the immigrants, we also draw from this distribution down, down here. For babies, we assume that they're initially born in what state? Susceptible. Ladies and gentlemen, susceptible. And so when the person is created, they're told what state they're going to start in. And this little branch takes care of routing them initially. As they first come in, they're routed to the initial state. By the way, where did the, where did the name of this go? It's sort of a wayward name. It, it somehow, it's almost like it, here. I don't know where the, oh, there it is. It's way up here in a flight of energy. I must have propelled it. OK. Um, so this routes them to each of these places. Does that make sense? And that allows us to begin the model with any distribution of possible values. And what I was making in this final slide here on sensitivity analysis was the point was we actually sometimes want to vary. We, we want to examine variability in that initial state. So we don't know the exact state. And sometimes you vary the initial model state. And sometimes you, you vary the number of people in a state. In an agent-based model, you can modify different numbers of people with the characteristics, et cetera. So here, we could sample through a, param a Monte Carlo one by running the model again and again and again with the same parameter values. That would be part of examining different initial states. Or we could examine different distributions if we wanted to. You know? But sensitivity and initial state is an important thing. Now tomorrow, when the effects of the Benadryl are more completely worn off for me, and I feel less like I am visiting down under. Um, we'll, we'll actually examine how models can deal further with uncertainty when it comes to accepting data and estimating their underlying states and parameter values from emerging data. Recognizing that the model is fallible, has a lot of uncertainty associated with it, and the data is fallible. It has uncertainty associated with that. We'll also talk with calibration about how we can posit some variability in data, and where some data is of higher pedigree than other data, and try to calibrate the model more tightly to that of high pedigree. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm indebted to you for your patience and uh, your, your sticking through another demanding session. Uh, I will now post for your. Uh, for your examination, the uh, model that we have created. It's going to be called version 15. And 
if you found yourself challenged to keep up, you can always grab that one down and examine uh, these components that we had in place. We have examined the mechanisms of parameter variation, sensitivity analysis, and if there are more needs there, I'd be glad to discuss them. Now is the time for the poster session. The students lie beyond yonder wall. You'll find them in the, in the uh, open area of the lab. And with your, with your uh, leave, I will rest. Thank you.